Hey everybody, welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast. Today my guest is Jennifer Collins, who is JDC Events President and CEO. Today we are talking about an incredible new event called Equipped 2021, which is an ambitious new event connecting first responders. Before we jump in there with Jennifer, let's get a listen in from our podcast partners. First up is a massive shout out to our partner, William Wood Watches. Chances are you already know William Wood Watches is, but if you haven't, you'll have seen them in GQ, The Times, Esquire, Forbes, The Telegraph, BBC, The Financial Times, Men's Health, upcycling firefighting equipment and utilizing it every single component that makes up the beautiful watches. They've won the Esquire Self-Made Entrepreneur of the Year. They were chosen by GQ Men's Health as the best men's watches to buy in 2020 and 2021. And they've donated over 50,000 to international firefighting charities. Now, there's so many ways to go on and find out more about William Wood Watches. Head over to williamwoodwatches.com. Check them out on their Instagram. Check them out on their Facebook. They've got a private group if you are a member, if you have purchased one of their watches. So jump on over, take a look, whether it's the Triumph, the Valiant, the Bronze, the Chivalrous. And they've even got the Tunnel to Towers 911 watches. Honestly, if you are... A a fan of the emergency services if you're looking for that gift for someone whether it's a new recruit whether it's retiree get over to williamwoodwatches.com and take a look i promise you will not regret it our second part of the podcast for today's episode is the incredible hikes hikes footwear is made in europe and they are an innovative high-tech functional shoe manufacturer and they meet the highest standards all over the world they cater for the fire and rescue the medical workwear police military forestry streetwear from our tactical frontline special forces operators to our firefighters boots on the ground hikes are keeping us safe in every single way as part of their partnership with the podcast they are giving away a pair of hikes boots every single month so after the podcast be sure to jump over to our social media feeds have a look for that post we are doing it every single month so get over there check it out there is no funny details to be had so jump on over check it out hikes uk a fantastic partner of the podcast Jennifer's coming to us from the USA and in a similar vein to the podcast we are going to learn about this new event that's going to be launched this year and how frontline emergency responders can collaborate and benefit from that shared cumulative knowledge to help us all face the challenges of the coming years so if you're sitting comfortably let's buckle up for safety and I will see you crazy cats on the other side Jennifer Collins (laughs) welcome to the firefighters podcast how are you I am well. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure. Great to meet you. So, Jennifer, you are president and CEO of JDC Events. But for everybody listening, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you join us from in the world today. Sure. I am joining you from the Washington, D.C. area in the United States. And JDC Events, we produce engagement driven live, hybrid, and virtual events for corporates, nonprofits, as well as government agencies within the state as well. You know, they do business globally as well. So (laughs) that is something at any given time that we may touch upon too. Beautiful. You first came sort of quirked my interest. I think I received an email from a member of the team in relation to the event that we're speaking about today, which is Equipped 2021, which is a new ambitious event, a way of connecting first responders all over the world effectively, but certainly from the States. And I was privileged to receive it. And it really piqued my interest to the extent that I wanted to connect with yourself and try and get a greater understanding because I'm lucky to see behind the curtain of a few things. And I think how selfish it would be for just me to have this conversation. So I wanted to jump on the podcast and uh, try and get as, try and drag as much information out of you in the hope that we can get as many people on board for the event. So for anybody that is unfamiliar with it, what is Equip 2021 and why did you have a drive to do something like this with emergency services? Yeah, Equip 2021 came out of the pandemic. And at my company, we have been working on behalf of first responders, organizations that support first responders for many years. And so we know this community. And so we started to see how much pressure and strain and continued stress they were under because of the pandemic and here in the States. And and even globally, there was some social unrest. Mm -hmm. But here in the States, we were really tagged with that. And so we wanted to find a way to help them, especially given they are already under pressure with their job anyway. And so it was just compounded. And so Equip came from that. We decided, you know what, let's start something where we can provide them with the tools, strategies, innovations, best practices that they would need to help to keep themselves safe as well as the communities that they serve. But really, it was to help to pour into them, continuing to give them the resources, continuing to help to inspire them as well as to build resiliency, to, you know, give them everything that they need to continue to push forward on another day. I feel that there is, there aren't too many organizations that can help 
first responders. Mm. So that was the genesis <laughs> of this particular initiative. Now, uh, I don't know how what it's like in the, in the, obviously you guys are almost like a, a larger version of, of us in the UK, especially in terms of population, um, geography and logistics yes. and stuff like that. But sometimes we're guilty of operating in silos in the UK where you have incidents in different areas of the country. And I imagine, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I imagine you see a lot of that in the States. There's, there's challenges and tragedies and stuff happening all over the place. And you referenced the pandemic then. But not only that, I mean, law enforcement and EMT and first responders have been facing challenges even before you know the pandemic happened, like you say, in terms of things like civil unrest. How yeah. much collaboration and sharing did you see prior to this? Because I definitely feel there's a massive need for more events such as yours. Do you yeah. think that they operate in Because I know a lot of businesses tend to operate in silos. We don't like to share our working out and stuff like that. But the emergency services are surely different because we're all in the same game. But do you see those silos still? I do. Mm. And um, <laughs> that's one of the unique features of Equipped as well, is that we are focusing on all first responders. So the law enforcement, EMS, dispatch, uh, firefighters, everybody to come together because we believe and we know that there's cross training, yeah. you know, for instance, you know, the mental health capacity or, uh, you know, just different ways of the scheduling or, or what have you. There's many, many different ways to cross train and cross pollinate in the sense of sharing information. Mm. But most shows deal directly with one particular service sector. Mm. And so you're talking specifically to them, which is, which is fine. But there still is some overlap. And I think that's yeah. where, when you think about where we are in terms of a world, is more of us coming together that are different mm. so that you truly can see the differences, understand how they impact you, mm. and how, because of those differences, that we still can come together for the betterment of where, whatever position that you're in. So there's no competition in that sense. But, the, but to your point and to your question, it very much is set up as a silo type of structure. I, my hope is, because I certainly think from a budgeting perspective in the UK, we're going to see less of that anyway, because we need to cross-pollinate, we need to collaborate more. I mean, in, in the US, yeah. you guys have been fantastic at, for example, with your firefighters and your EMT, they tend to cross over anyway, there's a lot of shared working, they will, they will often live True. in the same premises, the same buildings, utilise the same resources. In here our NHS and our fire service and our police are completely, I don't want to say completely separate, I'm perhaps speaking out of line there, but it is a long stretch to get people to connect with each other. Do you think there's going to be more sort of multi-skilled first responders versus I'm just a police officer and I don't do anything else, I'm just a firefighter, I don't do anything else. I think I always look at these people as, as skilled frontline first responders, kind of how you articulate it in your message really, and I feel like the more we can share those those learnings the more they're going to come in handy anyway because i see i see these people becoming more multifaceted and more multi-skilled in what they're required to do to serve their communities am i am i right in saying that is that because that kind of right i do i i do think that to be the case because you know when you think about it and 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 actually one of the speakers that will be talking at equip he's a police chief within oregon and one of the things that he's going to be talking about is alternative policing and meeting in the sense of bringing other people within the community together to help to go out on calls that potentially are nonviolent mm. that can decrease the level of participation for mm. his workforce mm. so that more people so that you can really help to not silo it, but help to just spread them out, especially if it's a mental yeah. health call or something along those lines, you bring in those experts to help you so that you aren't always sending the police in to do it like because a, like it's not necessarily prevention. something with exactly yeah. an early prevention. And so I say that to say in response to your question mm. that I do think that there is going to be more of that cross collaboration mm. so that it can open up those particular opportunities to be able to extend the reach because we're running into problems now and you may be doing the same in the, in yeah. the UK where the the personnel you know they're retiring where think, you know i think he, when you de-chunk the role as well up. like what Liz, you alluded to there yeah. when, you, when you de-chunk the role there are certain things like you, you use the uh, uh, police and enforcement angle there a lot yeah. of this can go out as you know like you say just going out as mediation effectively with some legal support yeah. but going out to try and resolve and mitigate the damage that could then be done rather than waiting for it to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate to get to the point where violence is imminent and i look at it the same when i think of us acting as first responders people have said before 
why can't you know myself included why can't we go and support the paramedics more and then you get people at the extreme end of the spectrum going what if somebody what if there's a stabbing or what if there's a poisoning or something like that so we're not talking about going to the absolute creme de la creme of what a paramedic or an emt is right. required to do right. but but you know people in the street can operate a, a defibrillator you know you we can go to a lot of cuts and scrapes you know a lot of um wounds laceration stuff like that we can treat them we already have the capability we have the stuff on the truck so it's great to see again i think you guys and girls are kind of leading the way with it but we will we will catch up eventually is my hope yes yes i think you know it's just it's it's hard to break out of the mold that you've always been in um but when you're able to just piece step by step to just chip it at it chip away at it it (laughs) it can really bring some benefits now, I was looking in the program and sort of what's been built around it. It looks like there's, I mean, I'm not surprised, but it wasn't thrown together. It looks like there's been some real strategic stuff. And it kind of breaks itself down into three critical areas, if I was sort of reading it right. So these are health and wellness, we've got community, and we've got the tactics and the training aspect. So I wanted to briefly just jump into each of them and talk about what people can expect and how you see the benefits, what benefits you think they're going to come away with, whichever one you wish to start with. Where do you see those three key strategies coming through in this? Well, it is a half a day program, (laughs) so we don't have, you know, multiple days and time to go after everything, of course. And and given that we're doing this virtually, that probably is a good thing. And (laughs) so we really wanted to focus on or hit upon those areas that are really, really critical at this point in time. And, you know, the health and wellness piece is something that is just over the top in the sense of what they're experiencing. So we'll be talking about things about prioritizing sleep in that particular sector or that particular category as well as really just focusing on how you can take better care of yourself. We have a firefighter that's going to be there speaking who started an organization called Food on the Stove, and it's to help the firehouses to prepare foods that are healthier because the number one cause of the firefighter death is not um, what they're no. doing in terms of the, their position. It's heart disease. And no. so... He wants to be able to really bring that to the fore to help them to understand the issue as well as to to provide those strategies on how to mitigate it as well. Mm. You made a great point there in and around sleep. I was looking uh, into it and I think it's Paul, if I get the name right, Paul Nystrom, have I pronounced that correctly? Yeah, Nystrom, Dr. Paul Nystrom. Nystrom, My apologies. Um, He speaks about sleep. Now, you know, historically and and still now, you know, we're a 24 hour service. We're always going to be, but also public, the, the, you know, the communities that we serve are also now 24 hours. So how, how, you know, without wanting to take the words out of Paul's mouth, how do you see us sort of expanding on the the benefits of sleep and trying to convince people to get the right amount of it and the benefits that they can draw from it um, in what Paul's going to share during the event? Well, you know, think about this. And yes, this particular sector has been 24 seven for just its inception. We get that. (laughs) But think about this though. 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago, we did not have the impact or influence of social media. And so now you have this added distraction, if you will, Mm -hmm. that always sort of keeps your mind going and, and, you know, you really can't look away. You can't get away from it because it also is brought into the workplace. So it's just something that helps to do the work as well. So you have other factors that are now impacting it. Yes, yes. (laughs) I agree. I think more curse than gift, but that's just my personal opinion. It's a very powerful um, thing. We've got to be careful with it. Some people talk about, oh, yes. no, it doesn't really affect me. I said, look, it's smarter than me. It's smarter than you. It's smarter than all of us. It's designed to be that way. Don't try and, and fight it. You've got to control your exposure to it because uh, it, it will get us all. Great. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, I think that's great because I totally agree with you. Yeah. But that's the whole point is that you can never talk about how to get enough sleep because of the way our society and culture has changed. Yeah. You know, we're like a 24, not only a 24 seven culture, but we need instant gratification. We need everything now. It's that dopamine, and so isn't how it? do you continue? <sighs> yes, we just get exactly. It all exactly. So how do you deal with that? You yeah. know, those sorts of things is what, uh, Paul will talk about in his session on really just how we need to meet the moment that we're in now. Yeah. You also make a great point when we were speaking about civil unrest and things like that. Now, this has already reared its head several times in the UK, but funnily enough, my biggest concern is not only what the police face, because they're almost trained to do it. You made a great point in the program that I was reading about self defense for EMS, because it yeah. shouldn't, you wouldn't think if you were going to apply for that sort of job 
that it is such right. a large part of what ends up being their day-to-day role because they do come under some horrific abuse which astonishes yeah. me and upsets me when I read it because I have a number of close friends who are yeah. paramedics the fact that, you, that they're now taking it, the, uh, the power into their own hands and empowering people with this self-defense aspect what sort of statistics mm-hmm. are going to be uh, um, approaches are going to be demonstrated with that because it's a it's a worrying area of frontline responders that I think is only getting worse as well yeah, you know, the violence is something that has been going on for some time. And it just so happens that there's a statistic out of the CDC that about 2,000 EMTs, they face some sort of violent incident over the course of a year. And That's a scary the number. purpose of this, it's scary and it's not a part of the job. No. And so you shouldn't, they shouldn't think that it's a part of the job, but that's some of the issue with this. It's almost like, that, it's just, it's like the worst kept secret. Do you know what I mean? We, yes. It's kind of like, we yes. go, oh, well, it doesn't really exist. And then you see some of the horrific yes. things that get done to them. We go to help um, gain entry for someone's called saying that they're, they're harming themselves. We will go and help mm-hmm. gain entry to a premise. Sure. And then theoretically, we're supposed to just leave and let the paramedics get on right. with it. We've gained entry. But I'm always like, guys, we've got to stick around because we, this, this, right. we don't know who's in there. And sometimes it'd be a paramedic by themselves, male or female. But I just still right. think... Uh, I don't know how it's done in the States. It just worries me. (laughs) Well, that's what's happening. No, really, you know, your sentiments are, you know, really appreciated because that's exactly what's happening. And so they go to an incident or a scene or what have you, and they're in their ambulance. The ambulance is being abused. They're being abused. And and it's all for many different reasons, perhaps. You know, people are under the influence of whatever they're under the influence of. But there's also more calls that are happening now. And so that's bringing more of it potentially. Mm. But with this, it's also not necessarily something that's being reported. We really think that it's really the the stats that you hear really don't reach the tip of the iceberg. It's really more of a problem than people realize. And so now people are really starting to get it out in the forefront and talk about it because society as a whole, I really truly don't believe understand no, the reality I think of we're becoming situation. Desensitized. I really don't believe it. We're becoming desensitized yeah. to it in the fact that it is so common. And a lot, yeah. of, a lot of paramedics and stuff that I know are empowering themselves by just attending self-defense classes in their part-time. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah. great that they're doing that, and it's great that they're taking that initiative, but they shouldn't have to. And it's, na- have it's to. naive for us to go, oh, well, you know, maybe it will get better. And maybe it's not. And we can't. We haven't got the resources to expect every EMT call, every paramedic's call to be attended to by a police officer as well, because that's just not realistic. Right. So... This exactly. aspect of, of empowering them with self-defense, some people may feel differently about it. They feel like that's not the reason they joined the job, but it's great to see we're not just pulling the wool over our eyes and we're not just pretending it doesn't happen because it is a real concern. It's a real concern. And that's only just one particular one particular mitigating effort. Mm. You know, there are other things that the departments and they're looking at of how to, you know, deal with the situation, but that's just one because what's also happening with our paramedics and EMTs is that they are committing suicide at high levels. And because of what's happening on the job. And so that also bleeds back into then the mental health component and the importance of removing the stigma so that they know that they can report it and that they also know that they can get the help that they need because of it. So there's a whole, it's really deep. We're not going to solve it at Equip per se, but it is something where we wanted to get into the conversation because it's important Mm. and we know it's important. It's sad that you say that, and it's honest, and I appreciate, and I agree with you. We've had a, uh, a gentleman called Andy Bibby who's ran a him and his company have ran a massive report on uh, health and well-being, and there's some really mm-hmm. scary statistics because I think of frontline responders or frontline workers in general and suicide. In all honesty, what came what comes to mind at first, and I think if you spoke to the public, they would go to military only because yeah. they are taken out of their normal environment, they are deployed abroad, perhaps. They see a, a tremendous amount of trauma. They then come back, and that transition has always historically, I'm not saying it's that way now, but we've not been very good at it. It's been very clunky, and it's been very difficult, yeah. very poorly coordinated, and so many people have fallen through the gaps and unfortunately chosen to take their own lives. It's so yeah. sad now to see that these people in our emergency services live and work in the country. They don't go abroad. They live within our communities. Yeah. They're tremendously more accessible we are tremendously more exposed to them. So theoretically, we should be well aware of the damage that's being done to them. But exactly. we're not where we need to be now. And it's so sad when I do hear of stories like that. And you're right, it's, you're, not, you're not talking about a, a, a single event. This is it's becoming quite a worrying a, a number. And yeah. you're right, it's kind of been bubbling under the surface for, I personally feel, about eight years maybe. But it's getting yeah. far too frequent for people to 
push it aside and go, oh, that was extenuating circumstances or that was due to something in their personal life. There's too much crossover. There's too much correlation with all of these people are working in the sector and we, we are seeing a debilitating health and well-being. There's also just such, in terms of our society a bit, yeah. the lack of decorum, decorum, you know, in the sense of just the respect for people and respect for positions and roles that people hold. And so, so there's a lot of different dynamics that are impacting it. And so they really, truly need as much support as they can get yeah. because it's going to continue to change. It's changed in the sense of it's getting worse. So we want to turn that tide. Mm. And so that's really where what we're thinking in the sense of, you know, equipped and moving equipped forward. Equipped is not going to be just a one and done event. No, no. It's starting virtually, mm. but it's going to be a launching pad for building community throughout the year. So these sorts of topics that we're talking about today mm. are going to be something that we are delivering through blogs, through one-on-one -on -one subject matter expert interviews, through podcasts, you know, through those sorts of mediums yeah. to really get that content out to support them throughout the year so that we can continue to provide that resource Mm. Uh, so that they don't feel that they're alone. And I think that it's important that actually it is done by somebody or a company or an organization that's kind of outside the emergency services. Because when you were talking then and you were talking about society in general uh, and civil unrest and decorum, I agree with you. And I, f I feel like I'm going to make a reach now, which is we see isolated incidents where public figures, figures of or theoretical authority or even just somebody in uniform, because I'm not yeah. going to say that the police are, are, are at fault by anything here, but people associate police and, and government with power. And then we stand alongside, and we will always want to stand alongside our members in law enforcement, because that's that's what we do, and we're all, we're all a team. But the good stories don't get the exposure. And you referenced social media right. earlier. We see these aspects where people feel an overwhelming, passionate, like they've been wronged by their, <laughs> the people that were supposed to protect them. And these are tremendously isolated incidents. The, the good incidents, the good outcomes don't get the exposure. And that kind of creates this idea that anybody in a uniform is there to subdue me, is there to suppress me, is not there in my best interests. And if we try to do this ourselves... I don't know that it would be as successful because it'd, it'd be it'd feel a bit hypocritical. Like, oh, you, of course you're going to say that. You're part of the emergency services. So I think it really does require some external companies and things like that stepping up and, and showing the best that is within the emergency services and trying to get that connection back. You know, because I remember when I was yeah. a kid, you would see yeah. police officers, first responders as a source of good. You know, you, and I still, do, I still do. I, my, I've got three children and I would encourage all of them and they do. You know, they would approach a police officer, a firefighter, anything like that. If they were in trouble when they saw somebody wearing a uniform, they go towards them, not away from them. Yeah, and I sincerely absolutely. worry that that may no longer be the case for certain people. They may be being raised to see anybody in a uniform. There's something they should fear. And that is a, that is scary because I would say 99.9% .9 to make an exaggerated um, percentage are there for good. They joined the job for the right reasons and they're, they're acting with good values that we're trying absolutely. to uphold. Absolutely. There are certain instances where, of course. and we know that within everything, within every sector, within every part of our society, there are always those bad apples. Yes. But the one issue with that is that it tends to, in certain instances, overtake everything else. Yeah. We know that those particular areas that may not be good do need to be addressed. And, and that, that's just critical and understood. But, you know, I have first responders in my family, you know, I, and I know many first responders and there are so many people out there with these special hearts mm. of running toward the danger to help somebody else. And so we do need to remember what their role is and yeah. that they truly are there to help you and not yeah. focus too much on the other side that yes, does happen. And we know it needs to be dealt with and addressed in terms of the bad, and it is but to not whitewash and paint the entire um, yeah. sector as such. Yeah. Because people don't join the sector for, they certainly don't join it for money. And I don't think they join it for right. power or anything like that. Right. If they wanted money or power, right. they would they would pursue uh, something else, you know, an entrepreneurial aspect right. or something like that. They join it because they want to try and make a difference. And I yeah. think um, that will always continue to be the case. But we've just got to remind people, and I love that that's what you're doing with the event. Now, a big part mm -hmm. of that for me is in leadership. And I saw in your notes as well, or in the notes that I've taken, sorry, that uh, Reginald Freeman, I've uh, looked at him before, yeah. Reg, he's a really interesting yeah. fella. And he's actually yeah. going to be um, doing a piece, uh, a keynote speak on leadership from the fire service, in fact, as well, isn't he? Yes, he is. And it trumps everything, you know, yeah. in the sense of how you're going to lead, how people are going to follow. 
And so that's what he really talks about. He talks about culture and he talks about really what you are bringing to the table in the sense of how, what do you expect me to be as a leader? And, you know, how can I support you as a leader? And so that's, you know, those sorts of principles he'll be talking about authenticity, communication, accountability, you know, trustworthiness, you know, those characteristics are just so, so important in terms of being able to lead, especially in this role Mm. and how dangerous the role is, Mm. you know, you want to make sure that people know that you're with them and help to bring them with you. Now, a big part of, uh, of Equipped as well, and, and kind of this ever-evolving change we've seen through the pandemic and the role of the first responder, I wanted to ask you about change because, I mean, a running joke always in the British fire service is firefighters hate two things. They hate the way it is and they hate change. So it's always <laughs> difficult to make them happy. But, like, oh. <laughs> but with, with the world now, I always say the only constant thing is change. We are going to see technology and everything like that colliding and spitting out and evolving so much change consistently consistently and you're going to have to be that eternal student but leading change is a very difficult thing to do i've had to do it in a number of different things in my service sometimes i've done it well sometimes i've done it poorly hopefully i've got a little bit better from your perspective you're effectively trying to lead change here in how we connect and how we collaborate what are just one or two or some of the key factors you think are important when leading change you know, if we had never experienced change before, you know, this whole situation that we're in with this pandemic, this has totally broken the mold, Absolutely. you know, and it's forcing us to do something different and to react different and to move differently. And so how I think of change is truly being able to reinvent mm. and reimagine your situation, reimagine what you do, uh, because the norms that we were so used to no longer apply. You know, people want to continue to go back to what they were doing pre-COVID, pre, you know, in 2019. We can't. That normalcy in that world is gone. Yeah. Period. Yeah. And And you can can kick and scream all you like, but we we have been dragged, dragged, forced, whatever. You can either fight it or go with it. You you know, if you swim against the current, you are just going to be perpetually frustrated and you're going to drown in a metaphorical sense. You've got to learn how to swim in this new current because it's only going in one direction. It's not going to turn around. And look how much it accelerated everything yeah. that we do, oh, yeah. uh, how we think and, you know, where we go and don't go. It's just accelerated everything. And so, yeah. so I, I get it with those people that are concerned about, you know, not being able to change very quickly because this is it is scary in the sense Absolutely. of not really having stability. I get it. I'm with them. Hmm. Uh, but I think the best way to mitigate and to manage it is to take it in bite sized pieces and to work on those areas that you know that you can change or that you see that there might be an opportunity to change for the better and work on those particular areas as opposed to what we had been thrown into, which was having to just change everything yeah. that we do. And a big part a of that is, of is the collaboration aspect as well. If you don't have any humility and you know manage, into, manage your own ego the, the, to the fact that if you yes. don't know the answers, you're not the only person facing these problems. We in the emergency services, we are not trying to cure cancer. We're not, or I'm sure we are trying, but you know, we're not trying to do something yes. revolutionary and try and reinvent the wheel. We've been here for a very, very long time. We're doing something that everybody kind of gets and we're not the only people doing it. This exists all over the world, it exists all over the country. So let's utilize that collaboration to say, hey, look, you know, we're all struggling with the same problems here. Let's try and get our heads together. What have you tried? What have I tried? Because every form of change and trying to cultivate that change is there's going to be failures along the way. But if you know you're not the only person trying something new, you feel less alone, you feel less alienated and as though you're trying to lead something and you're making all the mistakes and and there's no help out there. There is help. And that's where I see Equip 2021. Yes, absolutely. We're not alone. You know, and that's the whole point is providing those resources that people can grab and consume so that they can do something different with them to help themselves. Love it. Now, I wanted to close with a few personal questions, if I could be so bold. Sure. Now you don't okay. seem like a la- <laughs> you don't seem like a lady that is unfamiliar with personal development. You're obviously doing something like this to encourage other people to keep grabbing hold of that personal development lever and keep pulling it and seeing what comes out. What aspects of personal development do you currently engage with, and how does it play a role in your life? Well, I do a number of different things. I'm a ferocious reader. <laughs> you know, I read everything. And so I just love to consume as much as I can. And I do other things such as I, I'm a member of a CEO group. And so that helps me to have other differing opinions, people that can sort of pierce at my veil as to what I think I'm going to do and how and why. And then they tell me something different than I should consider. So I'm always looking for other opinions and education and information to help to continue to 
to keep me sharp for mm-hmm. one, but also to give me resources. So I'm not just you know, thinking in a vacuum, you know, mm-hmm. how can I see those differing opinions mm-hmm. and have those impact what I think yeah. and, you know, just help to, you know, just expand my mind. So mm-hmm. very much a reader. And that's, I would say is the main crux of what I do. I hear so many uh, aspects there when you talk about that, that group that you're involved with, that sort of formal, informal coaching, and also that value of association, yes. being around people yes. that are no better or worse than anybody else, but certainly holding themselves to a different standard and enjoying debate, not fearing having their, their opinions challenged and stuff like that. But I do love that you're also a reader. <laughs> they, they say all, all great leaders are readers. So is there any, yeah. it doesn't have to be favorite or best of all time, but are there any one or two books of any particular sector that you feel have been a real, oh my God, I've got to go back and read that again. That was great. Or have you gifted a particular book to anybody that you think would be really powerful? Well, gosh, I read a lot of different books. And so I read a lot of um, Harvard Business Review. I know people are just like, really? But it has so much great information about so many great topics. It's come a long way and as well. Topics, it's not too it heavy anymore. Long way. It used to be quite difficult no. to read. No. <laughs> yes, it was, but it really isn't. So it's actually very digestible. Yeah. Uh, so that's something that I do read a lot. But, you know, it's interesting. There's something that I did read during the pandemic, which was just so pro- appropriate. And I had read it before, but I just picked it up again. And it was Who Moved My Cheese? And so that particular book is about four characters, two little people and two mice. And they're in a maze and they're trying to find the cheese, but the cheese is moved. Yeah. And so it just talks about what happened to those who the characters that were trying to find the cheese that was there. And then there are others who just went ahead and found other cheese. Yeah. And so it really just deals in the cheese was really representative of what whatever is the success that you were trying to reach in your life. That's mm-hmm. basically the representation. But it is, are you going to change yeah. or are you going to try to stick with the status quo? Which role are you going to be in? And so it was very appropriate to pick that up again in yeah. the sense of what we were going through with this pandemic. It's like, are you going to just him and haw and just be upset about things aren't the way that they used to be? Or are you going to just plow forward and create a new reality? And that's what we did. I read that book and I I reread it after I read the study of Blockbuster and Netflix, because that was a very similar analogy for me. People that are married to the way it is. And they spend so much time majoring in minor things and trying so, exerting so much energy trying to get back to the way things were that again, if you just turned around and went with the current, you would realize there's a new iteration, there's a new way for you to continue. If if your why is solid, then you can keep doing the thing that you're here to do. You might just have to change your strategy or your tactic, but it's not about changing who you are as such. People think, oh no, you've changed or you've you've abandoned that or you're this or that. It's nothing about that. You you've got to have. I always say have really strong views weekly held and what I mean by that is be really passionate about the things that you know but if you have been proven that these things have changed or they're no longer the way they were you know have that openness to to take that on board and that's such a crucial aspect of where we are right now exactly and so those people that really didn't survive well through this pandemic and I'm not talking from a health perspective I'm just talking about from a mental perspective were those that truly had trouble with doing something different or getting out of the routine that they were normally in to see that there actually might be something different and new on the other side but you just have to put your toe in the water first to see if the water's warm absolutely you know you can't get there unless you touch the water first and so it's just, but not everybody was there. And I get it. And I understand it. I'm not knocking that. I don't want that to come across as it, but I do see that that was an issue with many people Mm -hmm. and still potentially is. Mm -hmm. So it's scary. It is scary. But now's the best time to do it because there's so many it people, is. there's so many other people doing it. Do you know what I mean? So therefore the resources yeah. and companies and all that sort of stuff, there's never been so much help from both the government and also companies and organizations to show people how to do that. And you won't seem like you're abandoning ship. You know, that, that, that ship has sailed. You need to now find out what lies ahead for you. And that's, that's exactly what we're doing here. I think. I truly believe if there was ever a time to change now would be it. <laughs> because of everybody is going through the same type of cataclysmic shift. Yeah. And so now would be the time yeah. to create that change for yeah. yourself. Even if you think the time has passed, I remember um, a great quote where they said, the best time to plant a tree was five years ago. The second plus time is right yeah. now. So you might think right now and go, oh God, I should have done this six months ago. That's okay. Do it now. Yeah. Okay, do <laughs> Don't it spend now. another six it's months. never too going. late. <laughs> Absolutely. Because then you'll be like, I should have done this a year ago. Do it now. <laughs> right. It's never too late. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about 
what's some of the things and this is not about regrets or anything like that but you're, you're in a wonderful role now and what you're putting together for the emergency services and first responders I think is incredible but is there anything you wish you had known when you first started out in this sort of career because that may be really useful for people yeah I think I didn't understand the concept of financial capabilities and capacity, okay. um, you know, when I was, was first starting out the business because I was planning and managing the events. It was something I enjoyed and I was doing, I was employee number one. And so that's how many companies are started. Yeah. And so I was doing the work, but in terms of growing and how you grow, there are a number of different resources that you need to be able to do it. And number one is money. And so I, when I first started the company, I didn't have that understanding fully of what I would need to continue for it. I have it now, but I didn't have it then. So that's probably the main thing I did not know, but also culture, the importance of building a company culture, people wanting, people wanting to work for you and work with you. You know, how do you build that environment that's attractive to people? And so that was something that was important to learn as well. I think you make a great point there in, in, in two aspects. Financial literacy was what I heard when you when you were talking then. And I think I can certainly speak from a UK perspective. It's something we don't teach. And when I listen to people like Kevin Hart, I hear the same that a lot of it doesn't get taught in the US either. We teach children how to count and we teach them how to read. Right. We don't teach them about finances. We don't teach them about costs and percentages and right. making those decisions. Because then when we come into the adult world and we're surrounded by some incredibly talented salespeople, we can get led astray so quickly. And That's you, you right. can, That's you know, right. a long time ago, you used to get to zero and that was the end of it. Now you can scream straight past zero and just keep going and going and going if you don't have that financial literacy. So it's great that you've been able to utilize that. And my sincere hope, while some people may think it's a dry subject, I've certainly benefited tremendously from it. I made a number of really bad business decisions maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. And it's taken me eight years to re recover from them. And uh -huh. I think it's really important that people do see the importance of those because money's not the most important thing in the world, but it is right up there with oxygen. You know, it is an enabler. You do need to be able to understand right. it. You do need it. Yeah, you, you do, do need, need it. it. I, I by no means worship it. But it is something that, you know, if you want to do something different with a company, you want to market your services, you want to buy some new technology, you want to do all sorts of things, you need it to do it. You need capital. Have a healthy relationship no. with it. Don't fear it. It's a very powerful That's thing. Right. People people fear That's it. Right. They think it's evil. They see all these strange things about it. It's very interesting. It's, it's just an enabler. It's just a thing. It's just a thing we have given That's value right. to. It's a tool. It's a tool. It's a tool. Yeah. You said you do a lot of reading and stuff like that. So my next question is around who in, who inspires you or even growing up, who inspired you? Was it somebody personally or can you think of, of someone that truly pushed you to be the confident, articulate lady I see before me? Oh, that's sweet. Um, I think who inspired me. I came from a family where I had entrepreneurs in my family okay. and my grandparents on my mother's side were people who had a cleaner's. Mm -hmm. as well as a landscaping company. And so I was able to see them and watch how that particular company, their companies were able to take care of their families. Okay. And so that gave me the inspiration that, oh, well, maybe I can do a business. You know, maybe it is something <laughs> yeah. that I can you know, make a living from. Yeah. And so that was my inspiration to continue to move forward mm. when I got into college to pursue moving on with a business as a lifestyle yeah. that I actually could make it doing it. And again, I think now is, is even easier than it was when we were younger, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was, it felt like there was less choices. You were either going to be a factory worker, a laborer, a doctor, emergency services, whatever. Now you can run a business doing anything. You could run a business selling, yes, selling yes. these microphones in front of me, selling whatever, whiteboards, socks, you know, running, running online courses. This has never been such a great time to be alive. As much as people focus on the negatives, we are surrounded by opportunity and, you know, people who have such a wealth of knowledge. Most of it is hidden in the books as well. <laughs> we reference back to them books. That's right. So much of this stuff That's has been right. done before. You've just got to pick it up and read the story of how someone's already been there and probably done 80% similar than what you've already done. So learn it, you know, learn it. Don't make the same mistakes. I love that. I wanted to ask just about a common piece of advice. So is there any piece of advice you think is very common in your industry now that you really think people should ignore? Well, what I've been seeing over the past 18 months within the industry are the people who really are focused on wanting to just go back to doing what they were doing. And so that's what I would say to ignore. I mean, I've seen it all over our media publications. I've seen it in articles. I've seen it in conversations, you know, talked with people about it. They really just want to get back to where they were as opposed to embracing the moment that we're in. And so that's what I would say is to ignore, ignore where we were 
that's gone. Um, <laughs> but think about how you can bring something new to where we are and how you can grow with where we are and how you can do something different and better in terms of, you know, the trials and tribulations we've had over the past 18 months and how you really can strengthen the delivery of events, reaching people, communicating with them. You know, how can we do this different now, now that we've had this experience? So that's what I would say, just because I still see so much of it. And it's just such a futile thought process because it's, we, we can't go back. That's yeah. why we just can't. <laughs> And why, in certain instances, do we really want to? No, that's because what I, I mean. Because I believe yeah. we opened up better opportunities. So that's how I look at it. It's mm. like, I'm not going back there. No, 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 because no, no. there are certain things now that are going to be so yeah. much better than where we were. Well, a lot of people, you say they want to go back and stuff like that. You, you, like you say, if you said to them, were you happy back then? They weren't happy, but they were familiar. They had a cer- right. they had certainty. Right. I think what fear right. what they fear now is not that they can't exist or can't be happy in this world. It's the the level of uncertainty. But the best that's place, right. the best way to, to you know secure your your certainty is educate yourself speak to people get resourceful don't stand back and go i'm not sure about any of this so i'm not dare going to take a step forward in case i fall through the floor speak to people ask around you know collaborate exactly right. what you've done my final question i ask all of my guests but actually when i was thinking this morning this is especially relevant <laughs> to yourself because it's about if you had a, a gigantic billboard in the sky and you had a message that you wanted to share with the world, which ironically is exactly what I think you're going to do with Equip 2021, <laughs> right, exactly. which makes it especially relevant to yourself, I'm doing it. what would we put on that? What is the big piece of guidance support that you would put on that giant billboard for the world to see? I think I probably would put something like, you're not too old and it's never too late. Hell you know, something, yes. in, the, something <laughs> in that sense of, ever, because ever. we always do put ourselves into those categories. Oh, I can't do it because I don't have this or I don't have that (sighs) or that ship has failed or I can't, you know, I can't, I can't, Mm. I can't, I can't. No, you're never too old and it's never too late. No matter what age that you are, you can start something new and you're going to have the benefit of age, you know, to help to, you know, that season is, Mm. you're going to be seasoned if you will um I'm, so I'm which so brings excited. other opportunities yeah i'm so yeah. excited that i've made so many mistakes in the first 30 something years right. of my life because now i've got 50 60 years to utilize all of yep. this information and i exactly. worry about people i mean i don't i don't wish this upon anybody and i know the the pandemic has delivered a number of big hits for a few people but i do fear people that haven't hit their proverbial rock bottom and i don't mean that from a health or a financial perspective but if they've not had something that's leveled them, where they where they believe something was the case and that was no longer the case, and they've made it through, if they've not had that yet, it's going yeah. to come. It is going to come. It so is. just be ready for it. it. Don't worry about that's it. Right. Embrace it. Empower yourself so that you're ready for it when it comes. Because this is not the first challenge and setback we're going to face. These are going to come and come and come and come. So it's, ride the that's wave. That's absolutely right. Equip that's yourself. Ride the wave Empower and yourself. keep moving. Keep moving forward. That's most important. Jennifer, I've absolutely loved that conversation with you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your su- out of your Sunday of all days, rest day, yes, yes. To, to be here yes. with us and, and get it across the pond. Thank you so much for that. I really look forward to speaking oh, with you thank soon. You. I'm going to really put all of the stuff that we've discussed, including who moved my cheese. That's going to be in the notes below for people that want to go and find it. But most specifically, how sure. to get involved with Equip 2021. For people that are unfamiliar, it's going to be in the notes. But just tell us, how can we learn a little bit more about it? Where do people need to go? They can go to our company website at jdc-events.com. And when you get on the homepage, there's a link called Equip. You just click on that and you'll see everything that you need to participate. It is that simple. Jennifer, thank that you simple. so much. Send my love to the family thank and you. I look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you again. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, there you have it, boys and girls. That was my conversation with Jennifer. If you want to learn more about Equip 2021, an ambitious new event connecting first responders, then go on, drop down and check in the notes below. You will find all of the details of things we've discussed there. Be sure to jump into our emails as well. That is where you're going to hear the utmost information when new episodes drop and also when different members of our incredible partnerships do those big giveaways to our listeners. That is where you're going to hear about it. Get on the email list. We don't fill your inbox with rubbish and we don't go giving your email addresses to anybody else either. So all that's left to say is thanks once again to you. Yes, you, the listener, for taking time out of your busy, busy life to be here with us. The podcast is going from strength to strength, and that is a result of the incredible people we have listening in. That's you right there. Please look after yourself. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay hungry. Support your emergency services wherever you are, and we will see you again real soon right here on the Firefighters Podcast. <laughs>